quite frankly, I feel that these books that I write are never going to hit with a mainstream <laughs> audience. And I would love for them to do so, but people find them too bizarre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make you you. Hey, I'm Tim Barnes. You are the genre. And in each episode, I ask awesome people about the first genres that inspired them, the first crafts that they pursued, and how they feel about those crafts now. Crafts. It's a hard word to say over and over again. Author, humor writer, and magazine editor Mike Sachs joins me this episode, and I'm honestly kind of amazed that I know him. Like, his phone number is in my phone, which is a device that has other phone numbers on it. But maybe I'm more amazed that he knows who I am, because reading his first collection of interviews was highly influential for me in terms of understanding how to write comedy and enter the industry. That book was titled, And Here's the Kicker, and features interviews with so many renowned comedy writers. And since its release, he's written a follow-up collection of interviews with comedy writers called Poking a Dead Frog, in addition to a series of comedy books in both written and audio formats. His parody novelization, Stinker Let's Loose, for example, was turned into an audible audiobook in 2017 starring John Hamm. The man is just a writing machine and is keenly aware of his own comedic voice, a voice that shines in his podcast, Doing It with Mike Sachs, which recreates a magical feeling of discovery. Like, say, finding an old album in a vintage store that has naked clowns on the cover. I wanted to know how Mike Sachs discovered the Mike Sachs of it all. And I think our conversation will be of particular interest to those who feel daunted by the slew of cancellations and consolidations right now in the entertainment industry. How can you move forward on your own terms and find satisfaction in your work regardless of validation from Hollywood's Mount Olympus? Well, Mike has forged a path that leads to a few solid answers. Now, there were some minor technical issues that you may hear in the following audio. I smoothed over as many as I could, and honestly, me even saying this right now probably preps you to imagine the worst. It really isn't. I just want you to know that when you do hear a glitch, I also heard it. Wow. Talk about a shared experience. Now buckle up and enjoy this interview with Mike Sachs. It's really cool to have you. This is like a sort of a full circle in a way, because I tell you this every time we hang out, but I was reading Here's the Kicker before I officially um, got into stand up and pursuing the art of writing comedy for television and stuff like that. And then right before I moved to New York, you had me on your podcast. I don't remember if it's the same name as the podcast you have now, but I remember it was like me and Joe Firestone were like paired on on an episode of your podcast produced by our mutual friend uh, Rob Schulte. And since then, it's been like, oh, wow, I feel like I've entered this world that seemed so far away. And you're a part of that entrance, I feel like. That's really interesting. I mean, I wrote the book for that reason, because when I was growing up, I could not imagine going from point A to point B. Like, how does one make it in comedy? And it's a lot easier once you do it and you know, and it's not as complicated as it should be. And the fact that that was your in, I mean, I was writing that book really for that type of reader who wanted to get into comedy, didn't know how. And perhaps I always imagine this reader as skipping math class in high school (laughs) and stumbling upon this book in the high school library. So the fact (laughs) that you said that is really nice to hear. Yeah, and that's exactly where things were. Like, what year was that? What year did the book come out? Oh, well, it came out the year my daughter was born. So that was 2009. 2009. Okay, so... I was a couple years out of high school at that point. And that was still a time where it was rare to find certain nuggets of information about how this this world of of like often TV writing and humor writing works. I think that's a very good point. I think people forget that. I had been trying for about two years to get this book published and there was nothing out there like it. And because of that, I was having a terrifically difficult time finding a publisher. And I only found a publisher in the end because I was friends 
with a former McSweeney's editor who was working at that time for Writer's Digest, a small publisher out of Cincinnati, Ohio. So it was only because of that 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 book was published. But this is pre, pretty much pre-everything, pre-podcast, certainly, pre-websites devoted to comedy, except for maybe the Onion AV Club. And there really wasn't much out there as far as competition. And that's the trouble I find I found later for the second book, and certainly now, if I were to write a third book, there's just a tremendous amount of competition. And I don't even think it's possible anymore, quite frankly, to put out a book like that. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, you got Judd Apatow as your competition now. That's that's. <laughs> well, that's just one of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> one of my many problems. His, uh, what's this called? Sick in the Head? Um, Sick in the Head, yeah. Do you see that as competition? Is that is that, did I spark, did I find some genuine nugget of... Uh, no, um, I mean, I, I don't, I think he views me as competition, if I may be so bold. <laughs> Or maybe he doesn't view me as anything. But I read that book. Um, It was interesting. I mean, I found it to be a good book for a 16-year-old to have been doing these interviews. And he was a kid when he was doing these interviews. It was incredibly uh, mature. I would not have been able to do that. I mean, the book really wasn't my type of interviews. What I was doing is a very specific type of interview, Playboy uh, type of interview, Paris Review type of interview, very detailed, not a conversation per se, as much as a very edited uh, conversation about writing, very specifically about writing and not performing. So um, I imagine in my distorted worldview that he looks at me as being competition, (laughs) but I don't think he gives two (laughs) about me or, or, or my books. Well, there are nuggets of information, and uh, here's the kicker specifically that I often think about. I feel like it was your interview with Larry Wilmore. I believe that's the one where he talks about a pilot that was shot with Paul Giamatti, where the premise is, it's basically the, the uh, Jim Carrey situation on In Living Color. Is that what it was? Or maybe he's the only white writer on a black sitcom, something like that. But something about that description of that of that lost pilot, that's like my um, holy grail, I feel like. Yeah, and I remember that well, too, because I think what Larry was talking about in that case is how difficult Hollywood is, that it was a, that was a difficult shoot uh, for whatever reason, but he remembers Paul Giamatti being just so nice and such a mensch during all of that. But every writer I spoke to had a story like that where they had a great idea for a TV show. And I think it was that idea where there was one white writer on in living color type of program. And um, everyone had a story about them being screwed over by the system, somehow executives, producers, or what have you. And it was an interesting lesson because all these people I interviewed, certainly Larry Wilmore and everyone else, I view as being very, very successful, but they all have frustrations. And that was, I didn't really realize that, or even Mel Brooks. I mean, anyone in the business long enough is going to have frustrations. So if they're going to have frustrations, it's normal for all of us to have frustrations. We just don't often hear about it from successful people. And I thought that was... Yeah, a good thing for me to learn at that point in time, because I thought that it was just easy street for certain people uh, in Hollywood. Hopefully through the premise of this podcast, we can learn what some of your frustrations have been. The first big nugget of truth to get from you is this question. I'm pretty sure we know the answer based off of your work, but what was the first genre that you were drawn to? Well, it was two things. It was Twilight Zone horror. The horror that takes place next door, not necessarily in space or uh, on a mountaintop in a mansion. I I found that too distant. But what what fascinated me about Twilight Zone was things that could happen next door or in a portal in your mom's swimming pool. You dive down, you enter into a different world. That fascinated me. And then it was comedy. So it was really the combination, I thought, if I could combine Twilight Zone type things with comedy make it a little bit scary a little bit off i thought it would be interesting and the first time i saw that done was with chris elliott 
Just going to pause it here because of one of those technical issues that I mentioned earlier. It's kind of difficult to understand what Mike is saying in the original audio, but the broad strokes are that he found some of Chris Elliott's characters on The Letterman Show to be unhinged and frightening, yet oddly satisfying. One such character is the guy under the seat, as Mike Sachs describes it, which sounds like a Stephen King novel. Here's a clip. Chris? Hey, Dave. How Hi. How are you? What is this the... straight? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, great. straight. What, uh, what are you doing? Well, Dave, you're looking at my own little corner of heaven. I'm moving in. Uh, Chris, this is a, a television studio. You can't possibly stay here. What? Oh, I get it, a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was no purpose to that character beyond just someone who was insane. And that combination of frightening and comedy appealed to me. And I think every character that I've written, not for the interviews, but for the fictional stuff, has Chris Elliott in it and has a little bit of Twilight Zone. I mean, these are people who are off in their own world and doing things that others might not be. And for reasons that only they see, they're totally delusional. And there's something about that that I find fascinating. I read this uh, piece that uh, Chuck Palahniuk wrote on his newsletter and it was the first time I even thought about, wait, why does a show like The Twilight Zone exist or shows like it, these anthology shows? And it's because these studios had all these excess props and sets and, and, and they just wanted a reason to like, you know, not throw them away and put them to good use. So if you think about it, like The Twilight Zone is a pretty cheap product. And that's the same case for a lot of late night shows as well. Comedy is very cheap and coming up with these mind bending stories about the person next door, like you were mentioning, is a, is a cheap thing to produce. But uh, within those limitations come all these magical things that people get obsessed with. Well, completely. I think that's completely correct. And that's a very, very different show to have come out. And at that time, it had a lot to do with the nuclear age post-World War II. And it's almost a miracle that that show existed when it did. But I find a lot of similarities between the Twilight Zone premise or Alfred Hitchcock Presents type premise and comedy. It's, it's reality just sort of bent a little bit and looking in crevices where others aren't and making connections where others aren't. Uh, so I see a lot of similarity between Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock, horror, and poetry also, um, making connections that others aren't making uh, with comedy. But I think there is a direct connection. I think that's why there is a lot of overlap between those who love The Twilight Zone and those who love comedy. So now that we know that these are the genres that you were drawn to, was it a major pursuit in your life from childhood to want to create one of these shows? Did you write horror stories or Twilight Zone type things? Were you submitting to humor magazines? Um, in high school, I would write the Twilight Zone type stories. And actually, Twilight Zone magazine existed. And oh I would, yeah, I would submit to that. And um, Alfred Hitchcock presents. And these were just garbage stories. I mean, I, a huge influence for me was Stephen King and uh, at a very young age. And I tried to write those stories. Those are the first type of stories I tried to write. But it always was easier for me to write comedy. It always became sort of comedy. So I try to combine the two, uh, make it comedy first and then a little bit frightening. And that really was what I was trying to do. But my biggest dream was to write for David Letterman. That was really my dream. And this was um, a little bit past the prime before they went to CBS. I mean, I, that was my dream to sort of freeze time and write when it was at its height. Uh, in retrospect, I don't know if I would have been happy doing that every day. I know writers, <laughs> and certainly you know about this, where you have to show up every yeah. day and write, and it may be better in theory. But I had no way of of getting to that point. I didn't know how one became a writer for David Letterman. So I started writing pieces for Mad Magazine and Crack Magazine and submitting to Playboy, which never worked out, New Yorker at that time, which did never worked out. But I thought by doing this, by putting it out myself, I would be discovered like a minor league baseball player will be pulled up to the major leagues after they're discovered. And of course, that is not the way it works. But by doing that and forcing myself to do it, I taught myself to write for print, which I think ironically in the end is where I belong. I don't think I belong in television. Um, I, it was always my dream to write for TV, and I have attempted to do it, but it just never worked out. 
which is fine with me because now I am in a medium which I enjoy doing the most. It's funny. Um, the Twilight Zone is going to pop up one more time maybe in this conversation, but I've always fantasized about writing for Late Night when I finally got to writing for The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon during the pandemic. It felt like The Twilight Zone because it, everything was severed from tangible reality. The show was taking place at the host's house. I was in my apartment. You're writing jokes that aren't eliciting laughter. You come up with a game for the host to play with someone and they're just on Zoom. And so uh, it made me deconstruct what is even the joy <laughs> of um, creating content without the live element of it. No, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because that's why I wanted to do it. Because to me, being in a room full of like-minded people was a dream because that didn't really exist for me in high school. Um, and being in a writer's room, whether it was in your show of shows or The Simpsons or Late Night with David Letterman, that was the dream for me to be around like-minded people, throwing around jokes, people who had the same sensibility. But what I found was <laughs> that that doesn't always exist. You know, the dream writing rooms uh, were rare. And um, the thought now of being with other writers in a room 12 hours a day is would be madness. But I can certainly <laughs> see where that would be. You know, it's funny. Sometimes you achieve a dream and it's a, just a different time. You know, you came up yeah. during COVID. So that reality did not coalesce or, or didn't connect with the reality that you had as a kid dreaming about I, writing for late night, right? So it's a different reality. <laughs> And sometimes when you when you see the reality of it, it's um, it, it seemed a lot better when you were a kid, and that certainly yeah. happened with me. I mean, I've I've written for certain magazines and done certain projects that I would have killed to have done as a kid, and then when you do it as an adult and you see the reality of it, um, and it's, that is not taught to you as a college writing student because a lot of times professors aren't out there in the world hustling. You know, they have their uh, professorship. Were there pitfalls along the way? Like, how, how did you make that leap? Oh, my God, pitfalls. When you entered I mean, journalism, was that escaping from the path of comedy and Twilight Zone type It, it was in a sense because um, I was in New Orleans and then D.C. And, you know, this was just as the Internet was coming up. And there was just nothing, you know, I didn't have the balls to move to New York, Chicago, Toronto, or LA. So I was, you know, sort of out in the woods. And the only way I could really make a living was either retail, which I did for 10 years from 15 until I was 25 at a record store, or what it was just to get a journalistic job. I never had any interest in journalism. I never took a journalism course in high school or college. Uh, never wrote anything. But those were the jobs available when I moved back to D.C., plenty of those type of jobs there. And the comedy scene in DC at that time uh, was nothing. Um, it's improved a bit, uh, but it, it was nothing at that time. So the only way really to make a living in writing uh, was to work as an editor and to do dry type of writing for these various associations or news services, then eventually the Washington Post. But I it was always my dream to then continue to you know, try to make it as a comedy writer. And it was only when McSweeney's came out in two, well, for me, it was 1999 that I submit, or when I saw it, I thought, okay, this is the type of comedy that I would like to write. Because before that, I had been writing for Crack Magazine and Mad Magazine, and it was fun and it paid well, but it wasn't my type of comedy. So when I saw McSweeney's for the first time, I thought this is a good fit for me. And that was really the first time where I thought, well, I had fun writing something that someone was interested in publishing. And when I first started, Dave Eggers was actually the editor at that time. And he got back to me, um, which I thought was just an amazing thing that there were like-minded people out there. So it was really the start of the, of the web comedy on the web that sort mm -hmm. of led the way for me until then I was really spinning my wheels. I had really no idea on how to go about getting anything published or, or doing the type of comedy that interested me. Is there a difference in the satisfaction for writing comedy that goes on the web as opposed to something that gets, that gets published? Like what is the, the specific joy 
of it as someone who does stand up and, you know, you write jokes or someone and they tell it that night, the satisfaction is so immediate. What What is the satisfaction of publishing a humor piece that goes out into a magazine? Well, it's, you know, I mean, I would be in cracked and mad and, and it meant a lot to my family that I was in there, but it didn't really mean much to me. And even though I wasn't being paid for McSweeney's, I would start writing these pieces that I didn't have to write in an, in another voice. It was my more natural voice. So even though I wasn't being paid for McSweeney's, it meant a great deal to be able to put out a piece where it was easy for me to write, fun for me to write, and I would hear from other people whose sensibility I shared. And that goes even to today where if I'm, you know, there's a lot of things out there I could be paid more for. But when I write a lot of these books that I'm writing now, it's not for a mass audience. These books are not going to be sold at airport bookstores, but it means more to me to reach, you know, 2,000, 3,000 people with a book that I enjoy writing and would enjoy reading as opposed to a humor book that agents or published mainstream publishers would want to sell in the humor section of Barnes and Noble. So that to me means more than any amount of money. Just making a connection with someone whose sensibility, comedic sensibility, I, I share because I didn't really experience that growing up. It's a little different than live performance where you get an immediate reaction via an audible laugh, um, but you feel like you're, you're, you're getting feedback from people from the McSweeney's posts, for instance, that are, are retweets or whatever. You're getting a sense of who's sharing it. Or just the fact that the publisher liked it enough to say, give it the okay to go. Um, are those the things that give you the endorphin rush? I'm just like, <laughs> just genuinely curious, um, especially as these things tend to evolve with social media right now. Well, see, I never had the balls to go up and do stand up or sketch or improv like you do. Only later, much later on, did I get up in front of audiences and read and get that visceral reaction and was something I never experienced. And that was really like going, f being a bar band, playing to no one. I've read to one or two people and then to opening up for like the Rolling Stones because I'm friendly with David Sedaris and he'll have me open for him occasionally. So he'll come out and give me a nice in introduction, which he does not have to do. He's just a great guy. And then the audience is primed and I'll come out and I'll read. And then you know, we're ha talking one to 2000 people. And that experience is something I had never done before. And it's completely different than writing for print. Um, because what when when I write for print, I'm writing alone in a solitary in my head, for people who will be reading it in a solitary fashion, very in interior. And if I write something today, it might go up on McSweeney's or wherever in a month. So it's very disconnected. But that connection that I feel when I do live readings now is very addicting. And I can see why comedians, stand-up, improv people would get addicted to that. But it was something that I just never had the balls to do earlier. I wish I did. I wish I had been involved in improv and stand-up because I think it's very, very helpful for any comedic writer, even if you write for the written page, to go through that process and to know what it's like to get a visceral re reaction or not to get one, which is just as important and informative. But for me, yes. I mean, the type of writing that I'm doing now that I'm not necessarily making a lot of money and that I have to do other things to make it work, this is a type of visceral enjoyment that I get because I have done mainstream type of comedy writing, whether for magazines, Esquire, GQ, Vanity Fair, New Yorker, but it just doesn't hit for me. Um, what were the keys to you finding your comedic voice for print in a way that's different from Mad Magazine and Cracked? Was it easy? Like, you know, was there a way that you sort of open mic'd um, getting to a point where you're very comfortable with your voice? Yeah, it's a really good question. And and I think the only, the I mean, I can remember the piece that I wrote where I felt like this is not difficult for me to do. It's not like pulling teeth and it feels right. Like I would write pieces for Mad Magazine where, or other magazines where it would always try to appeal to the editor or to this imaginary reader. But until it was me writing 
something that was felt real to me. It was very easy to do. And I think looking at it afterwards, it just, it felt more natural to me. You know, it's like finding your voice as a musician or anything when you can do it and it comes easily and you're not impressing another person. That's really when it starts to flow. And it took me years to reach that point. I mean, writing should not be excruciating, really, especially comedy. <laughs> um, you should it should be somewhat fun to do. And it was only when I started, I, you know, I had these ideas that Mad and other magazines never would have published. And I, when I started doing that for McSweeney's, it felt very, very natural. But the problem was, it just there weren't opportunities. Before. I mean, I could have put it out myself as a zine or had a few people read it, but there was nothing mass that I could have had a lot of people read it. So really, it does come down to opportunity. And I think that's an advantage for comedy writers nowadays, because the opportunity is out there. You can write whatever you want to write, however you want to do it, and get it out there somewhere, and people will read it, whether it's an article or uh, a book. And that has just never existed before. The frustration for me coming up, and I think a lot of writers, was that there were very few outlets, and you were always being told, either you have to write for these outlets or you won't be published. And that's a very, very frustrating place to be. And that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And, and it feels like an equivalent to writing for an editor or this invisible, you know, force behind a brand. It feels like the equivalent uh, for newer writers now is just this ever changing algorithm. And there's a way to write comedy for the algorithm. You know, what's trending on Twitter, for instance, and you write a joke built on that with a couple keywords and it can go, it can go viral. And I appreciate the way that you, you seem to resist that <laughs> With your use wow. of social media, your use of social media is pure um, zen with your voice. Like you're writing, you're just posting things that are funny to you, pictures that you've discovered that are funny to you, <laughs> right? Incredibly bizarre things, honestly. But they're, when I see them, I'm like, oh, that's very Mike Sachs. Well, that's nice of you to say. But I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I think I should play the game better because <laughs> I, I, um, I just, I think life would be easier if I did. But <laughs> <laughs> like to me, this it, these aren't weird social media type um, expressions or, or posts. To me, I just find them funny, and yeah. I think you know I could be doing jokes out there like everyone else, but it just doesn't scratch the itch. And I think that's kind of a problem in a sense because like your sense, one sensibility. Uh, you put it out. And if you're completely honest, you put it out and you really never know whether someone's going to like it or not. And you could have a um, a sensibility like Elton John's where you do what you want, how you want and it appeals to millions. Or you could do something that is much more alternative and less mainstream. And it doesn't hit with the audience. And quite frankly, I feel that these books that I write do not are never going to hit with a mainstream <laughs> audience. And I would love for them to do so, but people find them too bizarre. And, and I mean, uh, do you, how do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're just, uh, the question is, have you found a, is like a, a specific niche or do you think that people uh, scroll or walk past your books and say, not for me? You, you know I mean? Yeah, I mean, I hear it. I hear it from family. I hear it from <laughs> people who will literally say, I don't understand what you're doing. Um, and to me, it's very clear. I mean, I, if I saw a book like this in the bookstore, I'd be thrilled. But it's just bizarre. I mean, you know, it's like working in alternative radio. You're playing bands that your cousins aren't going to listen to in Starbucks. I mean, it's just not going to happen. They're not going to buy for their kids at, you know, Walmart. I mean, this is not mainstream s stuff. But what I have found is that by doing this sort of thing, putting out what I want, how I want, I have appealed to the right audience uh, in the sense that I can now get John Hamm, I can now get Pat Oswalt, I can get Amy Sedaris to be involved in these projects. Um, and they're not doing it for the money either. But I think and I hope they like what I'm doing and also respect the fact that I I'm not doing it for the money. I'm not doing it <laughs> for mainstream appeal. I mean, this is not going to be written up in People Magazine or Good Housekeeping. But I always do look at it as sort of a punk aesthetic 
which I grew up with in D.C. I always loved Fugazi, Minor Threat, and the bands that weren't being played on the radio, but it was just musicians playing what they wanted and getting it out there. And that, to me, was a freedom that I try to now have in my own life where I am in charge of everything. I put it out, I design it, and I write it. And it may, it'll never be sold in a Barnes and Noble, but that's fine with me. I, I don't care about that. I, I just want to put out these projects that interest me. And that's a, be- a beautiful space to be in and also a space that I'm, I feel, I feel like everyone is trying to reach because there are similar things happening throughout the spectrum of media. Stand-up specials don't mean what they used to. And that's also because, you know, everyone can make one. Everyone has a decent camera Everyone knows someone who can edit. People are putting their own specials on YouTube. And so old standards are starting to melt away. So the joy, it seems, has to come from a more personal space. Like you have to just genuinely get all of the um, the endorphins come from the space of like, yeah, I did something. I made a bunch of people laugh and that was wonderful. And now I just want to share it with people. But the bigger becoming a, uh, an Eddie Murphy type thing, it feels like it doesn't, um, exist anymore. And I think a lot of people are trying to get adjusted to that. Oh, uh, totally. It's a totally new world. Um, you know, the advantage of having every opportunity to put out your own special, your own book, your own podcast, your own audio series, is that you finally get to do that and there's no one telling you you can't do that or you have to do it a certain way. The disadvantage is there's a lot of stimuli out there. There's a lot of competition now. And what you're saying, where where Freddie Prince could be on uh, Carson and two weeks later have his own sitcom, uh, where George Carlin could uh, say something on Letterman and it was repeated every day at, uh, at school, that does not exist anymore. And I think you're right. I think it's more important than ever to not try to make it in the sense where you're not being honest yourself or you ha- you really do have to be honest yourself in a comedic sensibility way. And you can't try to appeal to either producers, executives, agents, or whomever uh, the connection you're going to make is with the audience or the readership. The problem is making that connection. How do you stand above all that noise out there? And that really does become a major component of being a writer. Uh, from my standpoint, you know, marketing for me is, I would say, 30 to 40% of what I do. And you really do have to come up with different ways in order to do that. Uh, and that's, you know, whether it, you know, and the, the traditional publishing will always say, oh, you need to have 500,000 followers on Twitter or Instagram. And I think that's totally off base. It doesn't take much for a word to get out there, but I don't think it has to be uh, all through you. It can be with help from others. And that's really the advantage that I have now working with certain celebrities who have many, many, many more social followers than I do. All it takes is one mention from a Patton Oswalt or whomever, and that can make all the difference. But I also think you have to be realistic. And that is, you know, I'm never going to be a millionaire from this. I'm never going to be on the Today Show. I'm never going to be, you know, it it is what it is. And I have total freedom. But I think you also have to understand as a mature writer that there is a limit to what you can do. And um, the freedom of that and being able to do that and making less money by doing that is is worth it to me rather than writing for a sitcom or writing for a morning show or writing for somewhere that just doesn't um, interest me. And I do have to do a lot of things to make a living that I wouldn't have to do otherwise. You know, I, I have to work as an editor at Vanity Fair and I have to write straight pieces. But by having this two track system, uh, it allows me to do what I do. And I, I don't, I think a lot of people, that frustration of not being able to do what they want to do, whether being told no from executives or not being discovered or this or that, it's a terrible position to be in. And anyone, who puts himself into that position, and I was in that position for years, it's it's just brutal, and it, it will just wear on you. Yeah, and the feeling of wanting to be discovered is kind of a disgusting feeling in a way. It is, like, and I'm, also it's out of your hands, because 
it's not someone else has to do it. And if you're going to wait for that permission, you're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a like a like it feels bigger than daddy issues. The 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 want to be uh, discovered by some ethereal talent agent or you know um, studio or something. Well, it's even bigger than that because I know writers who you know, will submit and submit and submit to the same place over and over and over again, and they're not being accepted. In my view, they should move on rather than circle the drain. I come across writers who I haven't seen in years, and they're still working on the same project. At a certain point, and this took me years to realize, you have to move on, and you have to, it's up to you to do so. Uh, you have to make, forge your own path, because if you're going to wait for someone to give you a hand – a lot of times these people who are in positions of power, gatekeepers, don't share our sensibilities. You know, the all the agents that I reached out to over the years, literary agents, I don't know if one shared my comedic sensibility. Um, I wouldn't say their comedic IQ was necessarily above 80, you know. So <laughs> don't put yourself in a position where, where you're going to be uh, not chosen. You just have to keep moving forward otherwise you'll stagnate don't scroll away you are the genre we'll be right back after the break you are the genre is currently independently produced not that i'm complaining it just means i haven't figured out how to place ads for online therapy services grocery apps and spacex which i assume is the world's only fully nude space agency if you are enjoying this podcast please leave a nice comment and rating. It goes a long way. And remember that if you become a paid subscriber to my newsletter, you get early access to episodes plus things like daily jokes and text interviews. Get all of the information you need at youarethegenre.com. Now, back to the episode. Where were we? I, I don't think I truly understood the genius of uh, what you're doing with your books like Stinker Let's Loose, where... What's the... the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> the, See, the here, here's an example. That... Even you don't know what the f- I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm, we're no, friends. <laughs> no, I'm saying the the conceit is the conceit is that it's a that this is like a novelization of a movie, right? Yeah, that's right. It, it's a novelization of a non-existent movie, of and non-existent. <laughs> so in this case, it was a 1977 CB and trucking movie called Stinker Let's Loose, and that book in particular was a very good experience for me and a very good lesson because at that time I had just broken up with my wife. We were separated, going through a very bad time. I was drinking a lot and I was very unhappy with writing for magazines. It just didn't fulfill me. And I thought, oh, fuck it. I'm going to do what I want to do here. And if a hundred people read it, that's fine. And I wrote this book and um, I had it designed the way I wanted it designed. And a few weeks later, someone got in touch with me and said, can I have, can I have the audio rights? And I said, sure, you could have them. I mean, <laughs> God bless. I don't know what you're going to do with them. And a week after that, John Hamm was attached to the audio project. Wow. Yeah. And, that, that, and it, to me, looking back, it's a very good example of if I had pitched that, no one in a million years would have ever wanted to put it out or understood it enough to put it out. But when you do something, when you have something tangible to show people and you put it out there, good things tend to happen, I found, rather than it festering within your own mind and being frustrated that no one else gets it. Just do it. You have that opportunity these days, which you never did before. Put it out yeah. there. And now it'll take, you know, six months of writing and four months of design and two months of marketing or whatever, but at least it's out there and then you can move on. And by doing that, it opened up a totally new realm for me that didn't exist before that. But I think the the genius of it hit me during this strike year where, you know, I write spec scripts and pilot scripts and stuff like that. And even if a pilot script is complete, in my view... It's not an end product. It has to be filmed in order to <laughs> in order to be something. It's a it's a blueprint for something that isn't there yet. And during the strike year, I've gotten more into writing short stories and stuff like that, and feeling the satisfaction of that. But also getting to a point where because the pilot scripts and things that I write aren't chasing 
trends of things that I, you know, that I get told that people are looking for. They're just like genuine stories that I feel make the most sense in the format of a script. And I feel happy that it's, that I can just see it there. Even just that is a, is a pure form of joy than just this sort of like, I wrote this script and now I need to try and try and make it, <laughs> pitch it yeah. to people. Right. I'm just happy that it, that I told this complete story and it seems like you found that with with these books that you're writing that end up having an audio form as well. Right. And but what you just said would even frustrate me to have a script sitting in a desk. I mean like take that script and put out an audio production. Get your friends in the business to put it out. And once you have that that someone un- then can have a-, a sense of what you were trying to experience, you never know what can come from that. I mean, just the frustration that I had over the years and friends have had of writing things that never got produced, that is not why people get into writing. You get into writing, especially comedy, because you loved it as a kid and you were had fun with your friends and you put out little productions, even though it was on your own little you know, recorder or what have you. That was why you did it, not to uh, write something and put your heart into something that will never be heard, seen, or read. And that is a frustration that I now try to avoid because the power of having a movie or TV show is just it, – it's beyond anything that a, a writer for the page will ever have. But to reach that point, I found, and to go through what you have to go through as a person and as a creative – a creator of this stuff is just not something I want to deal with. I mean, I would love to have a movie out there. I'd love to have a TV show, but from what I've seen, what I've experienced, what I've heard, it is um, not always the most pleasant experience. I'm not sure if we skipped past um, the second big question of this podcast, which is what was the first official craft that you pursued? It feels like it was, uh, it perhaps was a bit nebulous, but it was just seeking to be a late night writer, perhaps. Is that what you would say was the first craft that you pursued? Well, that was what I was pursuing, but I didn't know how to get there. So the craft that I sort of ended up teaching myself over the years and the hundreds of hours was writing for the written page. And it was um, jokes to be read on the page, whether it was a magazine or in books. And that I thought would would be my my golden ticket to writing for TV, and that just never happened. It it just became you know you write what you write, and then that's what you're known for. So I became known for, I guess, writing for the written page. But I, I'm happy to have ended up here because it's a very specific talent. I'll see writers for TV or movies or stand up try to write humor pieces for the written page, and it's a totally different beast. It's just totally different. It reminds me, I I once read an article with Wynton Marcellus, and he was talking about switching from jazz to classical. And he said it took him a year to get the chops to be able to do the classical album. And that's how I sort of view this. Writing for the page, humor-wise, is not getting up on stage and telling a joke or doing improv. It's sort of a lost start, or I thought it was a lost start, although I'm seeing a lot of younger writers wanting to do it, which shocks me because there's no money in it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it, you know, writing for uh, you know a short humor piece for a New Yorker is very different than uh, just uh, riffing on a podcast. And I think it takes yeah, it, you need the the tools to be able to do that. You need to learn to do that. I I feel like the last time we hung out with each other, I was kind of going on a rant about tangible experiences. Like back when I was in Chicago, if you're producing a show and you get it in this uh, weekly free paper called the Chicago Reader you know that people are going to go there. And something about seeing the name of your show on print that you picked up for free on the sidewalk felt like something. And the digital equivalent of that feels far less satisfying or interesting or or thrilling. And I have that same feeling about getting something into The New Yorker in a time where I feel like most people are reading it on their phone or their tablet as opposed to on uh, turning the pages. Completely. Um, does that bother you or, or are you adjusting yourself to that or do you have any fears around that? Well, yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I stopped submitting to New Yorker was it, it, it was a weekly humor, shouts and murmurs, and then it was tangible on the page and then it became a daily. And I, I felt that, you know, even getting it on the website now is a huge thing, but it didn't mean 
it had no weight to it, you know, and that's why I put out the books just to have something tangible with weight on the shelf um, means more to me. Otherwise it just seems to be free floating in space and and it gets lost uh, more easily. But that was the reason really. And I, I completely see what you're talking about. I mean, and specifically with the Chicago reader, I mean, I remember reading that, and, and or either either Washington City paper, which I grew up reading, there was something about print that meant, yeah, uh, and still means more to me. Now I'm not sure if that that'll be the case for my daughter's generation, although it does seem to be because she she prefers reading hard copy books to digital books, and I think there's something hardwired in us to want to physically hold something, and not only physically hold it, but to leave behind something that's physical like when someone writes their name in a tree i mean they're trying to outlast their own selves and i think writers um should leave behind something that is just not ethereal and free-floating and for me uh, books are that you know it'll sit on the shelf for better or worse forever as opposed to something i say on a podcast or something that i write for the web and that to me has always interests me how someone like Howard Stern views what he's done and he's been brilliant and had an amazing career, but you can't find 99.9% of what he did. And that to me as a creator would be very frustrating. Yeah, <laughs> that is. And there, there's some, there is a magic to those, um, those mysteries as well. I feel like there's a bunch of like the Johnny Carson tonight shows that they oh. either like, Completely on top of, or just, yeah. (laughs) Well, I interviewed one of the Pythons and he was telling me that the originals were taped or or about to be taped over, in which case we never would have seen any of those television. And it just shows you how, you know, quickly and horribly your work can be destroyed. And I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily you have to write your work on, L. Ron Hubbard type of post-nuclear <laughs> material to be discovered by the next uh, people who discover Earth. But I do think it's important uh, as as a creator to create something that has weight to it, that you can hold in your hand and say, I produce this. I often have this sci-fi thought of just a giant space magnet flying past Earth and just deleting the internet. And <laughs> right. I mean... Everyone has... <laughs> well, look at Web Crawler now for the, for the mid-2000 and how dated it, it looks. Now, no, imagine in 200 years what the <laughs> we're doing now. Who will give a <laughs> about this? It'll be out there somewhere. But who would want to dig into this refuse and want to take the time to do that? I don't think anyone. I'm sorry to turn this into like uh, um, cosmic uh, goop, but I, <laughs> that is not connected to the comedy so much. But do you find yourself uh, actually printing a lot of photos these days? That's another thing. No, no. I was really into photos when I was in my teens and 20s. And I always thought when I would get older, I would peruse through them with my family gathered around me. But what I found is that <laughs> it just depresses the shit out of me. Everyone's <laughs> dead and everyone is now a lot older. And I have no uh. desire to look through any photographs. I mean, the older I get, the the less interest I have in keeping anything. I just, I've seen, you know, my grandparents dying, my parents dying, and what we did with the their precious objects, you know, I, and I know what's going to happen with my precious objects when I died. My daughter would just chuck it into a f- dumpster. I mean, that's what happened. <laughs> this this sh- ain't going to the Smithsonian. So, I'm really trying to get rid of things rather than collect things and print them out. But I feel like that's that's an interesting point from what we were just talking about with the uh, tangibility of your books and things like that. It makes me wonder if we as a society are kind of in this space of exactly what you're saying about the photos of we don't want to think about mm-hmm. these physical representations of the recent past, not so recent past, you don't, you, you know, you just want to, you always, I always tell myself, I'm going to flip open my phone and look back at photos. But if it wasn't for the magical Apple algorithm, somehow knowing what's food and what's a vacation and putting together yeah, um, right. a montage for me, I probably never would have looked, looked back. Well, it's all too much. I mean, just getting by day to day is a lot, let alone trying to 
organize the past. And, you know, you look at what has been put out uh, career wise, you know, Johnny Carson had these VHS box set. How many people look at those? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just so much going on now. Uh, what does one go back and look at and what will one want to look at in the future? I think it's impossible to tell. I mean, for me, the only thing really that I'd want to leave behind are books and to have, say, five feet of material that I produced means more to me than, you know, the hundreds of digital articles that will be lost um, and w- but whether that's the case, I don't know. No one, no one really knows what's going to happen. And quite frankly, who gives a shit? I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. And you know, no one can figure out anything about the present, let alone the future. Well, I feel like we, we've we covered everything. Well, that's a high <laughs> point this, to end this on. It's, Jesus. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know, I don't know how, you, how you go go back from right, well, uh, death can I ask is the you most a question? final thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so... <laughs> You're a talent I highly respect, and you are doing a lot of different things. And you you worked, you got your dream job writing for television, and we're coming out of or have come out of the COVID years. What is it that you now want to create? What is your dream project that you feel is something that would scratch your creative itch the most? Well, it's funny because when you you mentioned this through line of a lot of your interviews of every comedian having this project that they reference as the one that got away, I recently worked on one that feels like it might be the one that got away. It's not it's not dead yet, but it was an audio series that I had connected with a, a network that um, that had a lot of heart and um, but also like a lot of practical longevity where it could be a show that you know could go beyond audio and become a live action show and and last as long as it as it honestly would want to but all to say that that was a project that um I feel like I found my voice through and and realized retrospectively that I was processing a lot of genuine things in my <laughs> in my own life within that one. And since then, it's more chasing that. Like even if that project goes away, I feel like I found the source of the type of humor that I want to pursue. And it's not tethered to stand up as much as I used to think it was, but I would like to create a show of my own that makes people laugh in a way that I feel like people aren't typically anymore, but I, I guess in a way, create something that's going back to <laughs> to some element of the monoculture, which seems to be what we're kind of dancing around with this whole conversation. I really miss certain elements of that, but I also appreciate how how much freedom all of the sprawling stuff that's going on now um, has given us all at the same time. But I want to bring people back to the campfire a bit. I think he just really summed it up. I'm, and we're we're a rare generation where we're going to bridge both of the of the divides where we came up and we had that monoculture, and we're going to die where that doesn't necessarily exist anymore. How do we try to figure that out? But I think what you just mentioned with the frustration of not being able to put on put out this product for whatever reason. I think uh, we now live in in an age where I think you could do that on your own. And that's one of the advantages we have, just being able to say, you, you didn't get it, didn't work out. So I'm going to put it out on my own and let's see what happens. And I think that's a freedom that we, that just didn't exist in the past. So hopefully you'll be able to put this out how you want to do it and, and to have that. And then, Hopefully something good can come from that. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And, and and yeah, it's one of those things where um, I, I'm sure you have this feeling too with uh, with your work. Where I hope that even if for an audio series, that it it kind of brings back this feeling of a party record. You know, <laughs> like it really, like some scenario. I think it's exactly what we were saying about uh, here's the kicker, where you're hoping that someone found it in a library, um, and it and and maybe you know brought it over to one of their friends. And that's kind of what happened with me and my friend Ian. Like we, we kind of like dissected that book like crazy and we felt like we found, you know, something that fell from outer space. Um, but the hope that you create something that just gets someone somewhere excited to share it with someone else. Yes. And, and the same way that 90% of my conversations with friends in a uh, high school was, you know, did you see the Simpsons over the weekend? <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Well, that's exactly it. And, and that joy, it disappears with a lot of people who go into comedy professionally. And I don't think it should disappear. I mean, just remember the joy you felt talking about the Simpsons on a, yeah. on a Monday after it was on the air. I mean, that's why you got in to comedy. And I think a lot of people sort of lose that, you know, why they initially got into it. Uh, and I think that's a shame. I think you, know, you get into it, it's going to be ups and downs, but it should be at the very least more interesting, exciting and fun than working as an accountant off of I-270 in an office park, you know, which I could have very well have done. <laughs> so I always try to look at it like that. It's like, well, there are certainly worse places I could have ended up. And I, I find it funny that, uh, you know, because your job at Vanity Fair sounds like a dream job to somebody. It kind of sounds like a job that someone would base, you know, would give to a sitcom lead. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But that world is ending too. I mean, it's, uh, you know, magazines aren't what they used to be, but you're right. I mean, I could meet various people in that world while also working on something that wasn't too far away of what my dream was. Now, would I have done it if I had enough money to quit? Probably not. But a lot of good, I do think, came out of it. Um, I certainly met people in the magazine world, including New Yorker, that I wouldn't have met otherwise. So it, I, I do think it's important to have a two-track system, but I think it's very important to choose a job that allows you to do your dream work. And a lot of jobs in writing don't allow for it because it's just too difficult. So that's sort of a, a combination and a juggling act you have to figure out as well. I've always felt like the key is treating your day job like a hobby and your hobby your hobby a little bit more like work no is that it's what perfectly you say that's the case yeah totally i mean the heart my heart was always 100 percent into what i was doing on the side maybe i shouldn't be saying this publicly um <laughs> uh, but you know the work was the work and you did it and you showed up every day and you know that's what i grew up with with my father and he, he went to work every single day and then came home and had his own interests and that's how i always viewed it um, and it, you know, you're right. I mean, really the heart has to be in what you're doing on the side because otherwise just life is way too <laughs> depressing, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> I was never one of those people who go, go to a job and then go to a sports bar and just chat and have a great time and then go bowling. I mean, <laughs> I needed something, uh, on a more selfish reason to get through life. Yeah. And I guess you could say this is sort of selfish, but it's the re it's the only thing I'm interested in. I'm not interested in most things and I am just more interested in doing this than I would be most other things. Want more from Mike Sachs? Visit MikeSachs.com, purchase one of his many awesome books and tune in to his excellent podcast, doing it with Mike Sachs. Freddie Nunez created the theme song and Adam Smith produced it. Saturday Night Live writer Stephen Castillo joins me next episode. But if you become a paid subscriber to my newsletter, you can listen to it a week ahead of the normies. This is Tim Barnes signing off with your weekly reminder that you are the genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what's your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make